Okay, well, welcome back, everybody, to um, the final session uh, of uh, what has been a fantastic uh, uh, event, I think. Um, apparently, uh, Heritage Exchange was trending on Twitter. It was the second in the trending on Twitter in London, uh, only behind the cabinet reshuffle uh, <laughs> earlier this afternoon. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, this is apparently not... Uh, unrelated to the fact that my comment uh, that Bristol is full of weirdos has gone viral. <laughs> so I want to apologize for that and clarify. What I should have said is Bristol is full of weirdos on Twitter. Um, <laughs> fortunately, I won't be standing for office in the Southwest any uh, time soon. Now, we've got a, a fantastic panel. They have been given the incredibly difficult task. Uh, of uh, reflecting on the many themes of this event and offering us a thought on potential uh, next uh, steps. So, uh, let's hear first from Deborah Mattinson, co-founder of Britain Thinks. Deborah. Thanks very much, Matthew. Um, and actually, I think the first thing that I want to say is what a fantastic couple of days. Um, I think it's been really brilliant. I found it so interesting, amazing contributions. And so thanks to everybody, really, and thanks to HLF for organizing it. Um, at Britain Thinks and, and in previous lives, I've, I've worked a lot in the heritage sector. And my role as somebody who is about opinion polling is to find ways of putting the public um, at the heart of the thinking of any organization that we work with. Um, Jenny referred yesterday to the work that we're just completing now uh, on behalf of Heritage Lottery Fund, which seeks to understand the impact of the past 20 years of investment uh, in heritage and the impact that that's had on people's lives and in their communities in 12 very diverse locations, uh, places like Armagh, Glasgow, Bradford, Lewisham and Shrewsbury. Um, now, that study is going to be launched in the autumn, and I've been warned that I must not reveal too much. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm now walking with great trepidation uh, towards telling you a little bit, a little bit of a sneak preview. Um, just a few observations uh, to some of the things that we found, and I want to try and relate that a little bit to some of the things I've heard over the last 24 hours as well. So, the first thing, and, and Jenny already talked about this, is... Uh, the good news, which is that there is a very clear correlation uh, between feeling positive about where you live and your engagement with local heritage. Uh, and what we found was that seven out of 10 feel that investment in, in heritage is a really good use of lottery money. And the people who uh, fund the lottery, people who actually play the lottery, are even more likely uh, to think that, 76%. So, so that's the good news. Um, Sorry, my phone's ringing. I don't know how, quite how to switch it off, so I'm just going to put it in my bag. Um, yeah. Pour some water. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just stick it in my glass. Um, so, but, but that kind of begs the question, which is what do people actually mean when they talk about heritage? And that's one of the things that we were trying to unpick with the work that we've been doing. Um, and at face value, what you get are a very long list of benefits, and quite a lot of those have been talked about um, today and yesterday but it often implies quite a transactional relationship between heritage and the people who use it. So people are likely to talk about how they can put a value on the economic impact of heritage increased tourism or employment opportunities, for example, or maybe on a more personal level, they'll talk about um, a nice day out for the family um, where heritage, heritage provides entertainment. Um, and that then in turn begs another question, I think, um, and this is the really big challenge for people trying to make the case for more investment in heritage and working in the sector in more, more generally, is if that's the case, then how is heritage different? And if you invest in heritage, what's the difference between investing in heritage or investing in, say, a new shopping center or a new leisure complex? Or, I mean, Albert said, you know, how can we persuade people to spend money on us rather than McDonald's? And actually, if you're thinking about a fam nice family day out, maybe it does boil down to that. And that, I think, is where uh, the kind of deeper emotional connection between heritage and the people really comes into play. And that's one of the things that has come through the research that we've done, um, particularly actually through the sort of more qualitative elements of the research. So the little film, those of you that were here yesterday, uh, that Jenny showed, that, that was a film that was uh, made during the qualitative workshops that we ran as part of this project. And there's a kind of wealth of information there that I think helps us to kind of 
better understand how heritage helps us all to better navigate the world that we live in. And I've just got a few thoughts that I was going to flag up. Um, the first is about having a better understanding of where we've come from and what that tells us about ourselves. And Kay Andrews talked about the tragedy, really, of kids in Wales not knowing where coal comes from. Um, actually, one of the locations that we were in was Pontypool. And what we found was that there's a, there's a, a, a thing there, the big pit. Um, it has a, it's a really powerful symbol for the people in that local community, not just about their past, but about the impact that their past has had in forging the characters of them now. Even if they've never been near a pit themselves, they understand it, and it really matters. Um, and the confirmation of how place forges our identity matters even more where identity is contested. And again, that's something that's been talked about a bit. Somebody said Glasgow needs to own its own sectarian past um, and, and, you know, and almost celebrate that. And, and certainly one of the things that we found was that heritage can play a really healing role um, and create social cohesion or help create social cohesion. Um, in Armagh, for example, um, the residents that, that we talked to in our workshop talked a lot about the impact of multi-faith projects in bringing people together. Um, more trivially, perhaps in some ways, but nevertheless very importantly, in Bradford, um, the curry was celebrated as being the envy of the whole country, being world famous. People were so proud of the Bradford curry wherever they came from, and it was something that, that they all shared, uh, whatever their own personal backgrounds. Um, I think another observation is about what kinds of heritage people are, are excited about. And again, there was a, a lot of talk about natural environments, built, intangible. One of the things that shone through, I think, is perhaps that intangible uh, heritage is rather undervalued, uh, maybe by the sector, but I think is, is often the thing that people, they struggle to articulate this, but it's actually what they mean when they talk about heritage. So we found many examples that, for instance, people talking about um, the Yorkshire dialect um, or the Glaswegian sense of humour was something that people in Glasgow were most proud of. That's heritage, and it came up as often as any special buildings did. Um, and it's interesting, Dan Corey's presentation this morning talking about how hard it can be to get funding for that kind of intangible um, project, but it really, really matters. So just, just a, a couple of things that I want to flag up just um, as I finish uh, in terms of what are the challenges. So the challenges are how you, I think, how, how we can unpick those learnings and <coughs> translate them into something real. But there's another challenge, and that came through, I think it's come through all day. People have talked about it being the people's heritage. But I think in some ways it wasn't until the last session that we got a real articulation of what that might mean. Um, because actually the data is quite stark. You know, not all people are equal in the world of heritage. And what we found was that the public breaks down into three broad groups. The super engaged, the engaged, and the disengaged. The super engaged are older and middle class. The engaged, I'm, I'm, this is a, a generalization, but the, 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 the engaged are more middle aged and middle class. And the disengaged are likely to fall into two groups. They're likely to be young, and they're likely to be working class. And what we found was that across the board, those groups of people were much less engaged with their heritage, and it's something that people have talked about, I think, a lot today, and it's, it's a real problem. So, for instance, when we look at the value of heritage, um, scores in the 90s on lots of different dimensions amongst the super-engaged and the engaged, scores under 40%, 30%, uh, on a number of different dimensions for the disengaged. So, so a real issue. And yet, what we found was that, for instance, working class respondents, DE, in the survey, were less engaged, but were more likely to feel, if they did engage with heritage, that it made a positive impact on their lives, that it helped them to understand their culture, their background, it helped them to understand the people that lived around them, and ultimately to feel more positive about it. So, you know, that there's the bad news, but also the good news. And I think that what we need to do, the real challenge, for the sector is how we can kind of unearth that deep and distinctive value of heritage and how we can make it accessible to everybody and help it to connect with everybody. So it's, I mean, Matthew talked earlier about more, more grit in the oyster, but I think it definitely is about fewer, fewer warm words and more action. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you.
Uh, uh, Deborah, can I just ask you one, one, one brief question? Uh, uh, we share a political past. I was responsible for maintaining Tony Blair's popularity in his third term, and you were responsible for boosting Gordon Brown's popularity, so we've both got a lot of credibility uh, in this area. But, um, <laughs> Thank you, uh, Matthew. Uh, you, at that time, I think, this issue of Britishness came up quite a lot. I'm sure you've mm -hmm. done focus groups and you've talked to people about notions of British values, worries of you know, you, the rise of UKIP, that kind of stuff. Do you, do you think that it's easier to talk about these issues at a local level than it is at a national level? Is that your, is that your sense? Or are there the similar kinds of tensions around identity and values in the local conversation? I actually think it matters to do both. Um, and that certainly was the case with Britishness. I mean, you know, if you ask people what, what they are most proud of in terms of being British, they'll say the NHS. Um, and, and that's a, a national thing, but they will also want to see it delivered locally. Um, I guess the same is true with heritage. Certainly one of the things that we found with the work that we've just done is that often for people, the more vivid, um, more vivid articulation of their heritage is what they live and eat and breathe every day of their own lives. And that will tend to be, it will tend to come down to what's unique and special about their area. Great, thank you very much. So next we're gonna hear from Professor Sir John uh, Lawson, who's chair of York Museums Trust and Yorkshire Wildlife. Trust. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. I, I'm probably unique, actually, in the present company in that I span the two, two of the main heritage camps. Uh, and uh, although I am by profession an environmental scientist, and my main interests have always been in wildlife and wildlife conservation, uh, and I'm also a vice president of RSPB as well as chair of the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, I am also chair of the York Museums Trust. And that takes in, it's a highly it's a pioneering, highly successful, uh, independent charitable trust that runs the Yorkshire Museum, the Castle Museum, the York Art Gallery, uh, York St Mary's Historical Church, uh, and the Museum Gardens. So my dichotomy is gonna be about those two parts of the heritage sector, which has run through quite a lot of the conversations we've had in the last, the last day or so. Let me first of all knock on the head the notion uh, that crept into several of yesterday's conversations that wildlife conservation and the environment and the heritage that goes with that is somehow the Johnny come lately uh, to the heritage <coughs> party. It was like sex, it was invented in the 1960s. <laughs> Let me ask you, I'm gonna ask you a question. So if, if you take the most published books in the English language in terms of the number of editions, the first is the Bible, the second is the complete works of Shakespeare, the third is Milton's Paradise Lost, what's the fourth? Oh, 10 seconds. No. Nope. 50 Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, in terms no. of the number of, the number of editions, number of editions. It's, it's, it's Gilbert White's oh, Natural, Natural History oh, of nice. Selborne, nice. published in 1789. It runs to well over 250 editions. I've got 80 of them, including a first edition. <laughs> <laughs> Sad, isn't it? <laughs> that says something about, and it's, it is intensely parochial by definition. And yet it, has, it, it fascinates people and it's a wonderful book. Um, the Wildlife Trust movement can be traced to Lord Rothschild's founding of the, what is now the Norfolk Naturalist Trust in 1913, 101 years ago. Uh, what is now Natural England was founded just after the war uh, and it's 70 years old uh, and is older than English heritage and so on and so forth. The, the heritage of the environment is not the Johnny come lately to the party. Um, and as for the rather effete notion that we heard yesterday that somehow as a nation we've lost the ability to recognize a cuckoo or a nightingale in the flesh, although we're familiar with them in literature, I sort of know the point that was trying to be met, the point that was being made, but the RSBB have over a million members. The Wildlife Trust movement has eight, over 800,000 members and as sure as hell they know what a nightingale looks like and sounds like. <laughs> So it's not a lost art. That's probably more people can recognize a nightingale um, or, or, or any other significant cultural creature than can recognize a Rembrandt or a Wren church. Now, heritage... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so and it, in my Don't view, the, 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 the sector that I know of, the sectors that I know about, the two main camps, if you like, <clears throat> two of the main camps, 
There is absolutely no difference at all that I can discern between the way museums, galleries, and garden heritage on the one hand works and the wildlife heritage on the other hand works. They enrich our lives, they, sense of they give us a sense of identity and place, a recurring theme through to the, the meeting. Uh, they, give, they give life uh, an emotional focus. Kay's wonderful work, Ku Nevin. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> They're essentially public goods of various kinds, um, and they can re require great skill and knowledge, or they can be enjoyed uh, at, a, at a much simpler level. They bring considerable local, regional, national economic benefits. They have profound, they both have profound health, both physical and mental health and well-being benefits, um, and they draw in dedicated volunteers and so on and so forth. There is absolutely no difference that I can see between wildlife heritage and the museum and gallery heritage in the way they engage with people at all scales and all kinds of levels. I have heard it argued, particularly today, to yesterday and today, uh, that uh, either explicitly or largely by the use of examples which speak volumes, that somehow, and Robert McNulty, by the way, was a splendid exception today, that man-made heritage, great works of art, cathedrals, stately homes, wonderful gardens, are somehow superior and more worthy of our support and attention than muddy-booted nature. I think that's bonkers. That's a technical expression. <laughs> if you take, it's interesting, nobody has defined heritage in a formal dictionary definition during these discussions. It's fascinating. Being a scientist, not a, not, not a literary person, I looked it up. Heritage is anything that has been transmitted from the past, according to the Collins English Dictionary, uh, handed down by tradition. Anything. Heritage is evidence of the past, such as historical sites, buildings, and the unspoilt natural environment. And in any, case, in, in, in any case, actually that definition isn't quite right because in the UK, or in Europe at least, there is no such thing as the natural environment um, except the tops of the highest mountains and the below high tide mark on the shore. The whole of the so-called natural environment is semi-natural because it's been moulded and modified by the hand of people going back millennia. The human, because of human activities, many much-loved landscapes, be they the South Downs, the heathlands of southern Britain, the Lake District, the North York Moors National Park, and so on and so forth, would not look remotely like they look if it had not been for millennia of human impact upon them. And so what that means is that they carry with them a huge amount of cultural heritage to make them the way they are. A lot of that heritage is invisible. It is the way we use the land and work it and so on. So even the, in my view, deeply flawed notion that human artifacts are much more important than the semi-natural environment in terms of heritage, that in itself is based on a completely false premise because the semi-natural environment has, is, only exists because of deep human heritage extending back millennia. People have talked about space shaping in the context of the natural environment in the, uh, in, in the meeting over the last day and a bit, and I'm going to finish by talking about that. I was fortunate to be asked by government uh, uh, to uh, review England's natural nature reserve protected area network, and I produced a report called Making Space for Nature uh, in 2010, which was incorporated into the Environment White Paper in 2011. There were a lot of recommendations in it, uh, uh, but the one that captured people's imagination was we recommended that there should be a national competition to establish 12 nature improvement areas. Big scale, really big scale, stuff you can see from the moon, landscape level, conservation, uh, and there should be a national competition to establish 12 of them. Um, and there will be bids, not from imposed from the top down, but absolutely from the grassroots, from the bottom up, uh, consortia of the willing. Uh, and I then got really, really worried that we wouldn't get any bids. We got 76 bids from all over England, so let nobody say that 
communities all over the country are not interested in nature conservation. They are. And they were absolutely inspirational. And they involved various mixes of local people coming together in groups because they wanted a nature, a nature improvement area on their doorsteps. Local authorities, local businesses, farmers, landowners, wildlife charities, statutory agencies like Natural England, the Environment Agency, the Forestry Commission, you name it, they were in there. An absolute avalanche of bottom-up community engagement. They're now in their third year. The leverage on funding, the government put in seven and a half million quid, which is small change down the back of good George Osborne's sofa, and that that money that the government put in has been leveraged between six and 12 times, depending on the nature improvement area you're talking about. Uh, there are 12 of them all over the country. Um, and they're being so successful that other areas that got no government money are actually beginning to copy them and say, we want one of those. We were quite like a nature improvement area and we're gonna do it. There's huge local pride and great enthusiasm uh, f for creating uh, nature improvement areas in your own area. And the really important thing is that is none of that is imposed. It is all grassroots, bottom up, partnerships between local communities and statutory agencies and so on. If we echo George Ferguson's film on the built environment, one of the bids was from a major North of England local authority. It wasn't Manchester, interestingly. But the chairman of that local authority in the bid said, access to high quality green space is not, repeat, not an impediment to economic growth in my region. It is fundamental to economic growth. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Now, now, John, you kind of made an accusation to the room, and I really love this audience, so, uh, and I also was head of rebuttal once, so I'm going to give the audience some chance for instant rebuttal. I don't think we'll bother with the question. I'm just going to ask you, there's two options here. One is, I am guilty of privileging uh, the man-made heritage over the natural environment. That's the first choice. Or secondly, I'm entirely innocent of the charge. Okay? So those who think they are guilty of the charge of privileging uh, the man-made man -made heritage over the natural environment, put your hand up. Oh. And those who think they're entirely innocent of this charge. <laughs> there we are. I've, 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 I, I've clearly been talking I, I, to the wrong people. <laughs> <laughs> now, can I just ask you a question, John, which would be very, very briefly, because we're, we're running over time. But um, Do you think that there is a sense, however, in which these uh, different things, heritage and the natural environment, appeal to different parts of our brain? That is to say, do you think that the appreciation of heritage, as we traditionally understand it, material heritage, is more cerebral, whereas the appreciation of natural heritage is more, as it were, a kind of right brain, kind of visceral, kind of almost spiritual kind of response. Are, are there different cognitive responses to these things? Yeah, well, if you read uh, Ed, e. O. Wilson's book called Biophilia, Ed makes a pretty good case that actually an interest in the natural environment in, in, in young children is genetically hardwired in. There is a strong genetic component to people's appreciation of living things. You lose it as you get older if you don't use it, but it's there. I have no idea whether anybody's done similar research on heritage. All I know is both of them enrich my life in broadly similar ways. But whether the components, the way the brain appreciates them, I don't know. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, so our next speaker is Sir Laurie Magnus, who is Chair of English Heritage. Laurie. Thank you very much. Um, I just, I, I'm slightly sort of punch drunk, I have to say, um, just because uh, we've had so much uh, coming at us. So I'm going to try and be fairly um, brief, but make some uh, key um, points. The, the, the first is about passion, because what is more important than anything else in an appreciation of the heritage, natural, or the built heritage, is a sense of the passion about it. It is a force for good. You always feel better in beautiful places. And whether it's uh, canafin or creative communities with a cause or quality of life, um, which was talked about by Robert McNulty, uh, it's actually, it's about everybody, it's about places and people and people, people really important. Places can't just exist on their own. They need life, and it's about passion. And the reason we're all here is because we're passionate, and that's why I'm 
doing this job. It's because of my passion for what heritage is about. And the second, second thing is really just to ask what, what is heritage, and slightly picking up on John, um, but also what is the heritage sector? Because it includes a huge range of organizations and people. It employs, it's estimated about 750,000 people, which is equivalent to about um, 3% of the total um, workforce of this country. Um, we haven't heard from a lot of people involved in the heritage world, from faith groups. You know, the Church of England alone is responsible for 45% of all grade one listed buildings in this country. We haven't heard from private owners. Private owners control, run, the most, the largest part of the heritage uh, across the nation, both natural and built. We haven't heard from them. They are critically important uh, in taking things forward. I was um, involved at the center of the National Trust for 12 years until last year. Um, and the National Trust has always had a, an issue about the um, divide between uh, the muddy boot on the one hand and the East Feet on the other. It's always been a friendly uh, divide. The National Trust has four million members um, and it exists to promote the permanent preservation of places of historic interest, all natural beauty for the benefit of a nation. And that is a direct quote from the 1907 National Trust Act. I don't see any, any real conflict, but it is certainly important that heritage is about uh, including everybody. And we need to be much more effective as ambassadors for the heritage and the role it plays in our national life, both in terms of social welfare, in terms of environmental welfare, and economic welfare. And one thing I would like to see as a resolution coming out of this conference is a call on DCMS to change its name to DCHMS <laughs> and put heritage back in its name, as it should be, as a very important part of what it represents. The third thing I just want to talk about is constructive conservation. Constructive conservation is something that uh, we talk about uh, continuously within English heritage. Uh, it's about listening to people, listening to what they want to do, making sure that we're not lecturing from on high. It's about finding practical uses for buildings and special places in a sustainable way, which takes account of new building techniques, uh, takes account of climate change, and embraces new technology, which has completely transformed uh, the way we operate, and will continue to transform the way we live and conduct interaction with each other. Um, I should say that uh, within the context of constructive conservation, actually we uh, manage something called the Heritage at Risk Register, which I'm sure you all know about, which is to tries to identify uh, buildings and structures which are seriously at risk. And the good news is that um, buildings, the Heritage at Risk Register, is falling. The number of buildings on our register is falling. That's great news because we're finding uses for these buildings and doing so at a time of um, some uh, recession. And the fourth thing um, I want to talk about is, uh, is just to pick up, uh, I was delighted to hear uh, Stephen uh, talking about uh, his, his capitalist background. I have a capitalist background as well. I worked in the city of London. I have to confess that I used to be a banker, uh, which is not <laughs> always a, a great thing uh, to admit to. Um, I uh, am absolutely a believer in letting the markets sing. I was tempted to quote Mao Zedong and say, let a thousand flowers bloom, but I think he meant something differently when he said that. <laughs> uh, I'm a great believer in the dynamism of the economy on the supply side, and we've seen that echoed time and time again in the third sector, in the charity sector, harnessing the internet, harnessing digital applications, finding new ways of raising money and funding uh, and making uh, places um, have a life and that's what it's all about. Somebody talked about DIY heritage, uh, and I'm all for that, opening up the business model to all. 
and involving volunteers. There are 400,000 volunteers in this sector. Let's make another resolution for this conference that within the next 10 years, there will be a million, a million volunteers uh, in the heritage sector, whatever that might be, as I've just said, criticizing myself, but a million <laughs> uh, volunteers working in the natural heritage and in the historic environment. Let's, let's set that as a target. And we need entrepreneurs. We need people who take risks. You heard earlier today from the wonderful Jonathan Ruffer. He's not here. So I can say this. Jonathan is a tremendous contrarian. When everybody thought that Japan was falling out of bed, Jonathan bought shares in Japan. That's why he's been able to uh, buy um, uh, those um, wonderful uh, pictures by Zerberan um, and um, to uh, launch the great project he has in Bishop's Auckland. We need more people who are entrepreneurs, who are prepared to take risks. And we need leadership, real leadership. That's absolutely critical. Um, and particularly, we need leadership when we're working in partnership. It's important to work in partnership, but we must be realistic. Partnerships need proper leadership. And it's on that note of leadership, I would just like to pay a particular tribute to Jenny Abramsky, who you know, has been a wonderful leader of the HLF over the last six years, has transformed so many places and so many people's lives during that period. I'd just like to ask you to join me here. here. Thank you, Laurie, that was great. I, I've just got one question for you, slightly leading question, which is you, you've taken over an organization facing incredibly deep cuts, which is now being broken up. How's it going? <laughs> I wouldn't call it broken up. Uh, it's being um, divided into two distinct organizations, and uh, they are going to emerge uh, highly visible, highly confident, and with a great future. Uh, we're waiting for uh, the governments to um, sign off on the consultation, which uh, I think many of you may have contributed to, um, and we're hopeful that that will happen um, in the near future, but I've started to learn that you never quite know when things happen uh, when government's involved. But um, we are very confident uh, that we will have a very successful uh, English Heritage Charity running our 420 properties, and we also are very confident about the future for Historic England, uh, which will be uh, there to support uh, the sector, um, using that term again, um, in, um, in, 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 in running, rolling forward and developing a lot of the ideas that we've been talking about over the last two days. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so now uh, to Sir Peter Bazalgette, who, as you all know, um, is the Chair of Arts Council England. Peter. Thanks, Matthew. Um, something strange and wonderful happened this afternoon. Normally at conferences after lunch, it gets very, very torpid. <laughs> this afternoon, it was of heritage on steroids. It went <laughs> berserk. <laughs> now, that might be partly due to our chairman's predilection for Mexican waves and questions about badgers. But it was more to do with a brilliant succession of speakers and a torrent of ideas, insights, and challenges. And I'd just like to take my hat off to the Heritage Lottery Foundation for hosting this conference and to John, who I know uh, organized it for them and put such a good list of excellent speakers together with so many great ideas. So I really, really appreciated, particularly this afternoon, I thought it was so rich with challenges, ideas, and new thoughts. So in those circumstances, all I can do is really pick three observations of my own from the last um, 24 hours. Uh, and the first is to do with our use of language, uh, not just talking about heritage, but also arts and culture. It's actually a point Mike Clark of the RSPB was talking about in his uh, address at the beginning of the day, use of language. Because last night I heard, I heard a sort of rhetoric which was about crisis, uh, cuts, austerity, and then I heard Dan Corrie this morning with his, from New Philanthropy Capital with his research he'd done, and he told us that 73% of the heritage organizations surveyed year on year, their revenues had stayed the same or increased. And actually, that mirrors um, the national portfolio organizations, arts organizations, which year on year, which we survey and publish in our annual report, which happens to be out today, um, we survey them, and in, in a year when uh, local authority 
contribution to arts organizations as a percentage of their overall revenue went down by 20%, and Arts Council funding went down by 7%, those organizations put their overall revenues up by 8%. Now, the problem here is uh, the rhetoric we use, because if we talk, if we just offer the success that that seems to um, indicate, and the uh, new ideas and the entrepreneurial ability, we offer that to the Treasury, we know what the answer is. So we're conflicted. We're all conflicted. We don't know how to talk to government. We don't know how to celebrate our successes without feeling we're going to get our, our legs cut off. And I, I felt that was sort of hanging in the air today. And I, for me, the answer to that is that we should talk about, well, some people talk about impact. Now, that to me sounds a bit like a car crash, Matthew. I heard you use the word two or three times. <laughs> Uh, we shouldn't use the word impact. It's a cold, impersonal word. We should be using the word benefit. Everybody says we're about humanity and people. We're about benefit. We're about conferring wonderful benefits, uh, heritage, arts, culture, benefits on people. And, you know, we, we had this point underlined that we're about people. Uh, Jonathan Ruffer said it. Liz Cameron said it. George Ferguson said it. But we are about conferring benefits. So for me, the benefits that we articulate which connect to things like education, health, Bob McNulty's point, by the way, in what he told us, uh, community development, regeneration. These, these are the things we do. These are the things we do. These are the benefits that we can offer. And if we connect ourselves into those strategies and political agendas, we answer the point, or we get over the point about, are we doing too well? Should we have money cut? Because it isn't about that. It's about attaching ourselves to things that society needs done, things that society values, and things that society will support and fund. So we need to get the rhetoric right, and I don't think we entirely have it right at the moment. Um, along those lines of celebrating some of the successes, while by no means belittling the pressures of the fact, uh, and Maria Bullshaw was eloquent on this, there's going to be less capital spending and let fewer... fewer um, uh, institutions, uh, buildings and so on that can be restored in future. Uh, there's huge pressure on local authority funding and museums that depend on local authority funding. Some of them are in real trouble. I don't uh, diminish that in any way. Nevertheless, there is something to celebrate. We are diversifying revenues and a couple of points about that. In social investment, we heard quite a lot about social investment today, which is a new area for everybody. One of the biggest challenges we have for heritage arts and cultural organizations is getting the skills into the executive and the boards that enable them to be organizations that can contemplate taking on equity, loan, whatever it is. We don't really widely have those skills at the moment. It's a challenge to all of us to develop those skills. It'll never replace public support, but by God, it can complement it. Equally, on the question of... Uh, um, diversifying revenues. One of the things that hasn't been mentioned over the last 24 hours, Matthew, but I think it's a real opportunity, is the way in which universities, higher education establishments, are redefining their role in their community as being responsible for their community, as being responsible for uh, enriching a sense of place. And to that end, they are more and more allying with arts, cultural organizations, and heritage organizations. And just to take museum examples, of course, Oxford and Cambridge have supported museums for hundreds of years, but Sunderland University is supporting the uh, National Glass Centre. Teesside University, as you know, is supporting MEMA now in Middlesbrough. And there are many other, uh, uh, I'd say early, no, there are a few other early examples of that. But the university's vice chancellors won't thank me for saying this, have got jacuzzis of cash compared to us lot. Jacuzzis of cash. And they're beginning to redefine its purpose, and that's something we really need to capitalize on. My third point, and I shall be brief, is that in the era of the digital, which is very exciting, we've heard quite a lot today about how digital is being used to enrich the experience. Uh, Bob McNulty talked about it. The physical is becoming more important because it's special. In an age when anything can be replicated, the physical, the visit, the actual thing in your hand, the, the event you go to, which is unique because it'll never be repeated, that's special. And that's a huge um, opportunity. And so immersive experiences like the one day in history at Mary Rose, like climbing the Masters, the SS, SS Great Britain, these are examples of huge opportunity we have because the physical is going to get more special. While enhanced by the digital, the physical is going to get be better. Now, that's three points, Matthew, but I'm now having a fit of jealousy because Laurie had four. 
And I'm damned <laughs> if I'm going to have fewer than him. I've got a really, I've got a really hard so, question to ask. Yes, you. I know you're going to be a bastard to me in a minute. Just <laughs> let, me make my four, let me make my fourth point. And it's to do with your weird agenda in Bristol, Matthew. What I say is, if George Fergus is an example of weirdos in Bristol, let's have more weirdos. <laughs> and, <laughs> and actually, I have a serious point there. You talk, Laurie, quite rightly about leadership and vision. Is it any accident that the elected mayors of Liverpool and Leicester and Bristol and London each have a vision for their city? And each of those visions involves arts, culture, and heritage. It's no accident. It's leadership. And we want more of it. So more weirdos, please, Matthew. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I quite, I quite like that. Can we, have a, can we have a question up there, which is, would having more elected mayors be good for uh, heritage? Could you stick that up in a, in a couple of minutes? Peter, this is a question I'm going to ask you while they're preparing that question. Um, uh, if you... If there was one lesson that the arts sector could learn from the heritage sector and one sector that the, uh, the vice versa, what do you think those would be? I'll give you a thought. I think the heritage sector is better at volunteers than the arts sector, for example. But have you got any thoughts about things they could teach each other? I know it's a hard question. It's a very tough question, actually, so you have been a bit of a... Yes. Um, let me think about that. Um... God, I haven't... Do you know, I have do you think about it while the question goes yes. up. Yes, let's we do are. the question let's I'll let, give you an we, answer. We, while we see whether or not you've uh, caught the mood of the room. Is the question going up? Yep, yeah, here it goes. Having more elected mayors will be good for heritage. Strongly agree, agree, unsure, disagree, strongly Absolutely. disagree. Oh, here we go. Disenfranchise. Disenfranchise. Totally, yeah. totally disenfranchised, Mr Chairman. This okay, I'll, I'll take a separate <laughs> vote from the front. Okay, here we go. We're crawling towards 150 and... Oh, 145 will do. Oh. oh, well, not many people disagree. Half people agree, and about a third don't really have a view. So it's quite... What about... OK, panel. That, that green column is elected councillors. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> they always hate mayors. They, Should I have excluded lose power. them? Panel, Must how would you them. vote on this? Uh, uh, where would you vote? Agree. Agree? Agreed. Agreed. Strongly agree. Agreed. Strongly agree. Very Just good. Agreed. OK, so that tilts the whole thing. Um, I, okay. Very, very quickly, I will try. I, I, now, try and answer yeah. my question. Uh, very quickly, I, I will try and answer your question. Um, I think I will accept your partial answer about volunteers because I think that's absolutely right. Uh, I think there's a great deal of um, problems around volunteers in that it is, it should, is, and should be, as you say, Laurie, a growing thing. But we haven't got it w between being paid and being a volunteer and how that works in an organisation. That's difficult. We need to work through that. Um, so I'll accept volunteers in that direction. In the other direction, I think possibly it's fair to say that as a result of how a lot of heritage is funded simply via the lottery, which is essentially a reactive funding mechanism which reacts to bids made, uh, that what heritage could learn from the arts is a slightly a more strategic approach to uh, investing in different bits sometimes. Uh, because uh, because, y y y because of it, it's a product of the funding. And there's a lady over there who completely disagrees with me and is going, <laughs> tut, 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 tut. So I apologise, but there you are. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's an attempt to a difficult question. Thank you, Peter. And, uh, and thank you, by the way, for, 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 for guaranteeing that weirdos in Bristol will be replaced by universities or jacuzzis of cash as a, t as a, t as a repeated tweet <laughs> comment. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I think we can guarantee that one will go viral. OK, uh, last but not least, Lloyd Grossman. Lloyd. Thank you. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, forget about weirdos in Bristol and universities that are laden with cash. The most popular tweet to emerge from today will be um, city magnate... Lori Magnus quotes Chairman Mao. I mean, that's, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a great one. And to quote Chairman Mao back at uh, Lori, I would say that uh, the chairman said that um, a revolution is not a dinner party. And a revolution is not necessarily a one and a half day conference either. But I think that this may be the beginning of a small revolution um, in the heritage field. Um, First, I, I think we need to remind ourselves of the fact that the heritage and heritage organizations are hugely successful. We have made and continue to make an extraordinarily positive contribution to the life of this nation in every single way, whether you want to be um, 
obsessed with numbers or whether you want to talk about the spiritual value. The heritage is hugely successful. So as Baz points out, um, we're not meeting in a state of crisis. We're not meeting to solve any particular immediate problem. I think we're meeting in order to think about how we guarantee our future success. Now, because we've achieved a tremendous amount, um, often with, with relatively scanty resources, uh, sometimes we do have a make, do, and mend mentality. So it, it's very important to inject a degree of innovation and new thinking into the heritage, and, and that's why this particular conference is so important. But I would say that we can't, um, we can't innovate until we declutter. And decluttering really involves refuting and getting rid of a lot of the tired cliches, a lot of the moldy old chestnuts, some of which we've heard over the last day or so. Um, for example, um, the idea that uh, we're going to be able to make a greater contribution if we uh, indulge in big top-down structural changes. Well, rearranging the NDPB deck chairs is going to do nothing for us. And um, I, I, I don't know if any of you are um, old enough to remember the last really big idea, which was, I think, around 2009. Oh, let's merge the HLF and English heritage. Remember that one? Well, that would have been a real picnic, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, um, you know, let's forget about these big top-down solutions. Those are very, very old hat, and I hope fervently I never have to hear any theorist propose them again. Um, secondly, I'd like to get rid of the idea that uh, somehow the heritage is plagued by divisiveness and rivalry. Well, what critics call divisiveness, I call diversity. And that diversity expresses the richness and the variety of our heritage, and also the fact that the heritage is pervasive. It is everywhere. And previous speakers, almost uh, all of them, have mentioned the fact that, you know, fundamentally, all heritage is local. And that's what really energizes the public, the, the sheer localism of heritage. And to me, you know, the idea that we should somehow think about merging the Oxford Preservation Trust with the Neen Valley Steam Railway doesn't make a great deal of sense. So let's celebrate the individualism and the localism that drives the passion of all our heritage organizations. Now, I think that one very important point um, w was, made by, was made by Baz when he, he talked about the need to find a new language. We do need better rhetoric. We have to get to the heart of government, uh, which is a euphemism for the Treasury. And thus far, we have not made that argument persuasively enough. We have reams of research. We have research coming out of our ears, but unfortunately it never lands on the right desks. <laughs> and what we really have to do is come up with a way of a persuasive argument that gets to the heart of government. We will never speak with a single voice because we all have different interests. However, on the really big issues, we do get together and we can convey a powerful message, whether it's on the NPPF, whether it's on VAT, we have a shared vision. We need to work harder at getting that vision across. And I think most importantly, and finally, what we have to make clear is the fact that, you know, there are, there are loads of things that this country excels in. Higher education, for example. You know, we are a fourth or the fifth the size of the United States, yet we have the second most important university system in the world. We are world leaders in the visual arts, the performing arts, and the creative industries. Yet all of those things are underpinned by the heritage. They, divide, they, they derive amazing inspiration and status and distinctiveness from the heritage. And the heritage is the skeleton 
that holds the whole creative and cultural body of this country together. And let's celebrate that and make sure that everyone knows about it. Like I just ask you, 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 right at the end, you talked about uh, evidence and the treasury, and then you talked with passion. In the end, isn't the argument for heritage one that has to be made really through passion as a matter of faith, rather than one that's ever going to be won on the basis of the evidence? And I could say to you, most of that evidence is not evidence that would cut muster in the treasury. Well, can I say that no evidence ever cuts mustard in the Treasury unless it's evidence the Treasury itself produces? Um, <laughs> occasionally, you know, we are driven, sometimes we are driven by government to be instrumental, which we do, and then at other times we're driven by government to be all sort of cuddly and touchy-feely, which we do, and at other times we're told that, you know, just... Just express your passion and your love. So every time we gather a body of evidence, whether it's you know, quantitative or qualitative, just as we're about to present it, we seem to be told, oh no, a different sort of evidence is needed. And what I feel positive about is the, is the fact that heritage, the heritage, has the ability to win the argument, both in terms of numbers and in terms of sheer emotion. Great, thank you. Now, um, I'm going to ask Carol Souter from the Chief Executive from HLF to, uh, to, to pick for her the kind of highlight of the day, particular point that she wants to share. But, but panel, I'm then going to ask you just one question before we uh, move to, to, to Jenny, perhaps making some closing comments. So I'm going to give you a little bit of warning of that, which is I'm, I was very taken, I think the whole room was, by the point that Deborah made right at the beginning of the session, which was that uh, young people, disadvantaged people, are the people who are least likely to feel an engagement with heritage, but the people who are most likely to get an, uh, a, a benefit, to use uh, Baz's word, a benefit from that engagement. In the face of that kind of tragic irony, as it were, what is the one thing that you would do to, one thing that you would do to address that? But before I ask the whole of the panel to respond to that one question, Carol, over to you. Well, I think that was, that was more or less going to be what I wanted to say, because I'd, I'd started worrying about a word that Baz will like even less than impact, which is metrics, um, because we all know that in any organization, when things are tough, what tends to be measured is what tends to be done. And if we move into what might be classed as other people's territories, I'm conscious that we then have to think about how we adapt to their metrics. So can the heritage sector produce metrics that will persuade uh, the health sector, the education sector, whatever, within their own terms, that we are worthwhile, et cetera, et cetera. So I started to worry about that, and they decided not to. Because, <laughs> <laughs> actually, the biggest question, uh, and forgive me, I can't remember which the amazing contributions this afternoon um, phrased it for me, is what is the sector offering and what is the sector offering in any one of a number of areas? So it's a classic not asking you know, what people can do for us, but what we can do for other people. And we know what we can do, but I do wonder, and this is my answer to Deborah's question, I do wonder whether we have the language mm. and the skills to explain to other people what we can do for them. And one of the things that I'm wrestling with is how do we, who are passionate, who are committed, and who are not, with the exception of some wonderful people here, but who are not, generally speaking, very young, very diverse, or very excluded, how can we make sure that all the things we know about and care about and love are set out on a plate that is attractive to the people that we want to engage and that we want to benefit from what we have. And for me, that is the biggest question of all of this energy and excitement and enthusiasm and passion. There are still not enough of us who have access to the joy that that brings, the inspiration that that brings, the excitement that that brings. And I think we have to ask ourselves whether if, if, forgive me everybody,
But if we were presented to uh, an estate somewhere mm. of new immigrant communities and said, these are the people who can share their passion with you, you know, how are we going to overcome what must be a certain degree of natural tension in that conversation? And I think that is the thing that we need most to think about. How do we find the language and the skills and the contacts to share what we all know we have to offer? Thank you for that. Last night I was chatting to Gillian Tett and she's, her, her latest book is about silo busters. And it's about the fact that, but it's written about the finance world actually, but it's written about people working, being driven to work in a very narrow way and how it is people seek to break out of that because in many ways innovation, creativity, personal fulfillment comes from breaking out of that silo. So it's part of the answer to your question, Carol, that as a sector we just have to become more aware of the challenges that other people are facing. We heard Bob McNulty talking earlier on about EDS and MEDS and saying that actually the sector's got a huge capacity to be relevant to education and healthcare challenges because those are budgets that will continue to grow and they're much, much, much bigger than the budget. But we can't engage in that conversation unless we have a reasonably good understanding of what's going on in those worlds. So as part of moving from an ask to an offer, being willing to try to find out more about the challenges that other sectors face. Yes, but I think it's also being brave enough to stop in our tracks and stop trying to meet our own metrics and our own requirements and prove things to people because we are all also very busy and one of the, th the amazing things that Joanna said was about the sort of energizing uh, nature of not having core funding and how tiring it is and I do think that one of the really difficult things for all of us is is to stop doing all the things we rush around doing just for a bit and think about what we already know. Of course we know. We're people. We live in communities ourselves. We shouldn't beat ourselves up about it. We know that life is hard for a lot of people. We know that there are things that a lot of people would like to do and they can't. Um, but, we, but we find it quite hard, I think, all of us in all of our lives to just stop for a bit and think, OK, knowing that, what can I do differently today that will help me connect in a different way? Thank you. OK, so panel, uh, very briefly... Uh, and Deborah, I'm going to ask you to kind of answer your own question first. What is the one thing that you think that we could do to address that powerful kind of contrast that you shared with us? Yeah, I, th I think it's really interesting because um, Jonathan Ruffer this morning talked about democracy of beauty, which I was very struck by. But the problem is that democracy actually shares the same problems that the heritage sector share. It's more likely to be practiced by people who are older and middle class. Um, so what can be done? I think it... I think it, the only thing that can address it is to involve the people that you want to involve in designing what you do, designing the projects, designing the way that they're accessed, designing what they do, and ultimately designing how they're promoted as well. Um, it's the kinds of things, actually, that Stephen talked about very eloquently this afternoon. I think without that opening up, you're never going to break through. Great. John? Well, the, the York Museums Trust board last week uh, took a, a, an interesting decision uh, we're going to set up a six-month experiment. The details are still going to be worked out. And we're going to remove the discounted entry for crumblies like me. And we're going to give it to 16 to 20-year-olds. Mm. And the grey vault will go bonkers in York. But they're wealthy. They have a much bigger disposable income. They can afford to pay for their entry. So we're going to transfer that, the, the subsidy to the young people and older people on benefits and so on. Uh, we've still got to work out the details, but we intend to roll that out as a six-month experiment, and we will monitor it very carefully to see what difference it makes to the uh, participation in the art gallery and the museum collections for what is, at the moment, a really disenfranchised group in Europe. Brilliant. Thanks for that, John. Laurie? Well, um, English Heritage uh, runs something called the Heritage Schools Project, which is funded by the Department of Education, um, which involves... Um, really guiding teachers, training teachers, and ways that they can uh, engage their pupils in uh, the history of their local surroundings. And um, there are three projects running at the moment in Great Yarmouth, um, Romford, um, and I think in Birmingham. And we anticipate that we will have reached about 100,000 children uh, by um, the time the funding comes to an end, which unfortunately is towards the end of, or the middle of next year, when we're going to have to find 
some alternative funding, because I don't think we can rely on government to uh, fund this. But it's a really, really effective and fascinating project. And I think my predecessor, Kay Andrews, actually was, was involved very much in helping to set it up. Um, and I think there's a lot uh, of um, potential there um, of trying to roll that out. And it's, as you were, those places I mentioned, particularly focused on um, communities where there wouldn't be much of a connection with heritage. But actually seeing a group of school children going to look at a local um, graveyard and identifying um, people who um, may have uh, relatives still who were uh, involved in the First World War is one case in point, which is, you know, it's, it's all about ma matching <coughs> people and place, but there's a lot more we could do, and it's very small. Thank you. Peter? Uh, slightly, uh, very good answers so far, and uh, quite a range, actually, all different. And, uh, I mind a slightly more prosaic answer, uh, but a practical one. We need to attach more intelligent, encouraging conditions to public funding, uh, to widen access. And uh, it's something we're trying to do at the Arts Council um, with the new uh, National Portfolio Organization deals from 2015. We asked everybody applying to give us their, what we call, creative case for diversity. 80% of the people applying were thought to have good or excellent plans. Now they've got to execute on it. But it's a condition of the funding, and we'll report back on it. We'll hold ourselves to account. So we do need to galvanize the power of public funding to widen access. And listen. We're very creative in this sector. We're very good at marketing. We can do this, actually. Perhaps we just need to force ourselves a bit more. Thank you. Lloyd. Well, there's probably a lot we could learn from the universities in terms of the way they've conducted their outreach programs. We also know from them that it takes a very, very long time to shift attitudes amongst an important sector of the population. I, th I think we are doing some very good work in, in terms of access, in terms of um, attractive pricing. The most important thing we can do is to continue to make sure that we offer young people an incredibly good experience. Thank you. So, uh, panel, can you just stay on the stage, because Jenny is going to come up and make some uh, closing comments. But can I ask you to join me in thanking some of the fantastic panel, Deborah, John, Laurie, Peter, Lloyd, and Carol. Yes.